today about how you know that God loves you, or if He loves you. And when you look through the Bible, if you want to believe that God does love people, you have to look at some of the people He's made, some of the people He has taught and lived with and counseled and worked with and been in the lives of. So if you start right from the beginning, look at Adam, ask yourself, did he love Adam? Well, certainly he loved Adam when he made him, and he fell, he disobeyed a command that God gave him, Adam fell, and you might want to ask yourself, did he love him anymore? I believe he did, I believe he never stopped loving him, and I think the evidence for that is all throughout the Bible. One of the best evidences is in Jeremiah 31.3 where he says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Now I know people can say he meant just certain people, maybe just Jeremiah, maybe some of the prophets, but I don't believe that's true. I believe he's loved all of us with that same everlasting love. He loves us as individuals, he deals with us individually, and he has that love for all of us. And it's up to us to reject it or not. But I'm stating a case for you to consider. So, let's move on down the road a little bit. Move on to Abraham. Say, did he love Abraham? He called to Abraham at some point in Abraham's life, when he was still Abram. And he told him a few things. And Abraham listened. Abraham believed in him. And it said of Abraham that, that he... Believe God, and that's why Abraham was righteous. So there, you can put that aside maybe and say, okay, Abraham was deserving of God's love. Okay, let's just set him aside for a while and look at some more people. Moving on to Moses. Moses, for the most part, was obedient, but he did fail. He disobeyed, and he was not allowed to go in to see the promised land. Did that change God's love for him? I really want us to think about this. Did that have any effect whatsoever on the way God felt about Moses? Did he love him less? Did he stop loving him? Let's go to uh, David. David is always spoken of fondly. He's the only one in the Bible said is a man after God's own heart. Now clearly, I think it's safe to say God did love David. And he said David was, obedient, David was obedient except for the matter with Uriah. But he did, did have a lot of blood in his life. His son wasn't like that. Moses, I mean Solomon wasn't like that. Solomon didn't have all those issues with all the warring and the blood and everything. Although it wasn't said that he was a man after God's own heart like his father. we got a mixed bag here of a lot of people. And let me jump down further. Because, I mean, I know you go through all these prophets and, and look at them, and some people have said there's no evidence that Daniel ever sinned. Uh, he, he prayed a prayer on behalf of his people, including himself. I think Daniel understood. He, he did sin, so I don't think it's right to say that God would love us based on that. But if you want to believe that God loves you based on your lack of sin, well then go ahead and maintain that. I'm asking you to consider these things. So at the end, we can all kind of consider together. So it's jumping ahead to the apostles. The apostles, the disciples, they walked with him those three, three and a half years. And they learned of him. And obviously, they were a mixed bag. Sometimes they, you know, one time they asked for him to call fire down from heaven. And he kind of scolded them. One time, two of them. The sons of Zebedee came to him and said, Hey, can we sit one on your left hand and on your right hand? And he didn't say no. He didn't say yes. He said, That's not from me. But that shows you who's sitting on the throne. And there's one throne. Because he can't have someone sitting on, on his left if he's the right of someone else. But anyway, that's a side note. So he has this continuing mixed bag of people who I presume he loves. Of course, I'm going to extend it out that I believe he loves all of us. You don't have to be an apostle or a great prophet or some known person in the Bible or some person with all kinds of credentials in the eyes of men on this day that we live in 
to be loved by God. I believe he loves all of us, but let's just say there is a criteria that God loves you, and at any point he can stop loving you because of your failures to exceed a certain standard. And I want us to think about that as, how do you know that? How do you know when you reach that limit with him where he just gets fed up with you? And I, I wrote myself a couple of notes about Peter and Paul. We can say it to any of them, really. Did, uh, although I'm sure someone's going to pop up and say, no, there's this case where it happened, but did he threaten Paul? Did he threaten Peter? When he talked to Peter, he asked him, do you love me? He asked him that two times, do you love me? And Peter responded, you know I have affection for you, Lord. Because he couldn't lie to him. Because just not many days previous, the Lord had said, you're going to deny me. So Peter knew who he was dealing with here on some level. He knew that this was, I believe he knew it was his God. And he knew his God loved him. And he wanted to love his God more, but he had to be honest with him. He said he would die before he would let anything happen to him. And he failed in that. It wasn't that he was a liar. It was just that he understood a little bit more about himself now. That he wasn't the one. It wasn't about him. Peter realized at this point, at least to a certain extent, it's not about him. It's about his Lord. It's about his best friend. It's about his God. So he questioned that two times. Do you love me? Yes, Lord. You know I have affection for you. The third time, Peter, do you have affection for me? <laughs> and the, ever, the only thing that remained the same was, feed my sheep. So he continued to say that. What was Peter going to feed the Lord's sheep with at that point in time? Was he going to feed him with three years of theology? Three years of the Torah? Is that what he was going to feed people with? I mean, I know we look at the day of Pentecost and say that's what it was all about. That's how Peter fed his sheep. I think there's something deeper at work here. Something deeper at work. Because the main thing Peter would have been able to feed the Lord's sheep with at that time, considering what he was going through, because it said it grieved him that he asked him the third time, do you have affection for me? Because he changed it. Remember that? Instead of saying, do you love me, Peter? He said, do you have affection for me? He already told him that two times. The only thing, or the number one thing, Peter could feed his sheep in a personal sense is, my Lord, my God, my Jesus, my best friend, my everything, he, he loves me, he accepts me. Right where I am, I wanted to just throw the whole thing away and go fishing. And he came here, and he showed me how much he loves me. And he loves me so much, he's willing to trust me with work he wants done. He wants to do it with me. That is what Peter could feed his sheep. I know he said this big, broad statement to thousands of people on the day of Pentecost. I'm talking about when B Peter talked to people one-on-one, -on -one, what he would have been able to share. It was the love his father has for him. The acceptance his father has for him. That's the number one thing he would have fed anyone. Any sheep. Any person. That was it. As I said earlier, did he threaten? Did he threaten Paul? Did he threaten Peter? He didn't threaten either one of them. He came to them and revealed to them the great love he has for them. And that he wants to do things with them. So he did. It's seen more in detail with Paul because throughout the book of Acts we see Paul doing things. But he's doing it with his God. That's the point. Is he wants to do things with you. So, if you want to ask your question, ask the question, does God love me, or how do I know if he loves me? I think it's already answered in the Word, and by, by the Word, the Word of God, which is Jesus Christ, your Savior, the Holy Spirit, who comes and tells you these things. And it's not by man. It's not by your performance. It's not by you meeting a certain standard or a certain criteria and upholding that or exceeding that to make sure you never fall out of favor with him. Bottom line, does he love you because of what you have done and are doing and are going to do? Is that really why he loves you? Do you really believe that? That's why the Lord loves you? 
Or do you believe that he loves you and the proof of that is what he's done for you and what he wants to do with you and continue to do with you? Maybe what he's doing with you right now, hopefully. He's doing things with my wife and I all the time. He shows himself to us. We're not saying we're unique to that, that no one else. We know he's doing things with lots of people all the time. It just the more aware you are of that, the more, well, the more aware you are, the more real it is. Because he does work with people and through people. people. We saw with Caiaphas, Caiaphas prophesied that one had to die for the nation of Israel. He didn't appreciate that because he didn't even know what he was doing. But do you want to be used like that? Or do you want to be used by the, the one who wants to do things with you? So it's not so much of being used, it's of being with. And that's the thing that I think we need to think about is we got a God who loves us like that and wants to do things with us. So he just did the thing. He did the God thing, to coin a phrase. He saved us, or he offered us salvation through his total and complete forgiveness so that now we can know he loves us and we don't have to deal with that issue anymore. Because you can't really get down to business of doing whatever it is you're going to do with this friend of yours this Lord of yours, this Savior of yours, this Jesus of yours, until you know He loves you. If you're always wondering about whether or not He loves you, you got to deal with that first before you can get down to business. So He just did that. He proved His love. I mean, what more do you want Him to do besides die on the cross? Is there anything else He can do to exceed that? There's certainly nothing you can do to exceed that. And that's the point I want to get at, is He loves you because of what He did. He loves you because He's good. You have value because of the fact that He gave Himself for you. He gave Himself for you knowing that you can reject Him. He did that, risking that. And the way it looks, it seems like most of us reject Him. And that's great love. That's the greater love. This is love. Not that we loved Him, but that He first loved us. And we can grow to love Him through that. But He is the one who does everything first. That's our God. That's our Savior. He loves us because of what He did. He made a decision. I'm going to do this for them. Because He had to, or else we could never get near Him. We're never going to get near Him through our performance. We're never going to get near Him through our obedience. It's simply not going to happen. It was never going to happen. That's why He established the New Covenant. The New Covenant, as it says in Hebrews, the old one is fading away. It's fading away. It's still there for the purpose it serves, and that's to drive you to his mercy. It's a schoolmaster. That's what the law is there for. But he loves you because of him, his goodness, his obedience, his perfection, his kindness, his patience. That's what it's all about. And if you're going to portray any of those things, if any of those things are going to come out of you, it's going to be through your knowledge and your intimacy with him, through his changing of you, because you believe that He loves you. That's what's going to change you. Not, oh boy, I, I did all the commandments today, Lord. God loved me. God loved me now. I did what you told me to do. You owe it to me. It's not going to happen that way. It's never happened that way, really. It never has. If you really look at it, it's never happened that way. I know even in the Old Covenant, it was different. But he just loved people. He always has and he always will. Except now he's offered this eternal gift of life. Through his death, burial, and resurrection. In that spirit, when it comes to dwell within you, you have this new life. Life of being loved and accepted perfectly by your God. You have that. It belongs to you. It's yours. Just between you and him. It has nothing to do with anyone else or anything else. Any action, any circumstance. It can never change. So I answered the question, so sorry about that. If you disagree, go ahead and leave some comments. But that's how we know God loves us. That's how you know God loves you, because of what He's done. It will never have anything to do with what you've done. Because you'll never, there's no way you would ever know if you've done enough. And you don't want to believe some religion that just tells you to jump through hoops and jump higher and higher and higher to make sure you get past whatever unknown standard it is till you get there. Hopefully... Hopefully you're able to perform high enough. That's not what it is. You know he loves you. 
because he said he loves you. Believe that. Rest in that. Have joy in that. And never have to perform again for anyone. Because that's all empty. It's all flesh. The only change that happens is when you know how much he really loves you. You believe that. That's when he really gets to work on your heart and change you. So it's a thought to consider. How can you know? And if you don't agree, I'd like to say, we welcome the comments. But we really ask you to take it to God. And ask these questions. How can you know he loves you? Is it going to be by something you do? Or is it going to, buy, or is it going to be by what he's done? Because once you realize what he's done, the two of you can finally get down to business and start doing things together. In Jesus' name, amen.